All right, everyone. Welcome to the official third episode of the Puddle of Grunge podcast. We hope you enjoyed the last Jar of Flies listen through slash review for the 30th. Um, yeah. What are we talking about today, Colby? Today, we're going to be talking about uh, some of our favorite guitarists from the 90s. Yeah. We've uh, rounded up four guitarists that we're going to be talking about today. We talked, we alluded to a lot of them in our first episode when we talked about the big four. Mm-hmm. So now we're going to kind of go over some guitarists that we didn't talk about. Yeah. So, the first episode. yeah, we're going to go over one that was in the big four um, and then another that maybe should be considered being part of the maybe big big five maybe um and then uh we're talking about more new metal slash funk metal with the other guitarists and then just more kind of alternative with the last guitarist we're going to talk about so without further ado i think we should just get right into it so the first guitarist that we're going to be talking about today is jerry cantrell okay ryan so this is this is your guy yeah, hold on. Let me. You can't bring it in the right. You can't. Jerry's my guy. Um, obviously, huge Jerry fan. Huge Jerry fan. Um, yeah, man. Just about every single track that he's on for Alice in Chains just makes it for me. Just the the songwriting ability, the riff writing ability. Just oh man. He's got an interesting use of guitars as well. Yeah. Like the guitar that he chose to play. Oh, the Gino Rampage? Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. Talk a little bit about his guitars. Yeah, so Jerry mostly uses a GNL Rampage. I think it's from mid, the mid-80s. Um, they don't make them anymore, sadly. But, yeah, it's got a um, Seymour Duncan JB pickup in it with uh, I can't remember what the um, bridge is, but Kaler. it's not. It's a what? Kaler. A Kaler bridge or Kaler. Kaler or Kaler bridge. It's different than a, a Floyd. There was a reason he wanted that. Um, can't remember why, but he said it in a uh, an interview that I was watching. But um, yeah, no, the GNL Rampage is like his main go-to guitar. He also has his No War GNL Rampage, and then he has a uh, Telecaster um, body style um, GNL as well. So his most go-to guitar, I'd say, is probably GNL, which it's a it's just a different guitar you know it's still made by fender right i think fender makes gnl uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah it's subsidiary i think they're more i think i read something that it was like higher quality than g than uh fender is what leo fender was going for with gnl mm-hmm. just with the style of like pickups and stuff because their their pickup styles are weird you see like the um they're like split kind of um as like a single coil it's kind of weird looking but We've uh, played quite a few uh, GNLs at Sweetwater, and yeah. the they really play nice. Oh, they play so good. I can see why he would want to use them, especially, like, I use mostly a Rosewood fretboard, and um, just because I, no, I don't know, maple, just not for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Rosewood fretboards on the GNLs are so nice. They just feel great on your fingers. Um but then Jerry also uses multiple Les Pauls. Um, he's got his his cigarette polka dot one with, that's made with cigarette burns, um, his wino. And then he's got his signature one that just came out with Epiphone. It's like the all white um, with, I don't know if they're active pickups, but it's so it's sick. Yeah, pretty much every guitar that Jerry uses is pretty iconic now. Yeah, yeah. But now let's get into his playing. Oh, man. Yeah. So, man, where to even start? Like, just the, I mean, they have their own signature tuning. He has his own tuning that he call. I mean, E-flat, obviously, it's a basic tuning, but, you know, it's the Alice in Chains tuning. That's it's how. Becomes, it's become synonymous with Yeah. Now. And, I mean, it, it, it's their sound. Like, that is the classic Alice in Chains sound, just dark and mysterious almost. Um and that's, I don't know, something that I, I love the heaviness of Jerry's riffs, but they're not so heavy that you can't hear the notes. Um, you can hear everything so clearly. And just the way that he phrases his riffs and his solos just have been a huge inspiration to me. Yeah, he's very precise while making it seem like... Uh, he's just noodling. Yeah. Yeah. 
and his, his excellent use of trills. Mm-hmm. Uh, he it puts them everywhere. Yeah, he does, and it's like you wouldn't even notice it, uh, especially like um, um, like we die young or something. Trills going into the um, into the solo. He's doing trills in the solo, and then coming out of the solo doing trills as well. And then you got something like I Stay Away doing a ton of trills in there in that little pre-chorus section. Um, Man in the Box, obviously, he's doing trills. Um, hammer on pull-offs. I mean, even in there, yeah, if you don't know what trill is, just a hammer on pull-off. Um, but even in, like, their later stuff, he's um, doing a ton of stuff like that, like on. Uh, what's that? Uh, grind. Yeah, grind. Yeah. Oh, a, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he does a ton of them on grind, and especially in the solo. And then he does. Um, I want to say it's on so close, um, or or head creeps. He does them too. But I just think that technique is so cool. It's um, it's really bluesy, but it's also very metal at the same time. It it just sounds so sick to me. Uh, it's very much a metal stylistic. Yeah, I think. But Jerry is just such a amazing riff writer Mm -hmm. as well as being an amazing lead singer practically as well yeah that i think that yeah that's something that also i'm like just fascinates me with his playing is coming up with those riffs but also like singing it at the same time because i mean it's it's not really hard once you've played guitar for a long time to sing and play but coming up with those riffs and having the ability to figure out how you're going to sing over it is super challenging. Like on the, on, on a wood, he's, he's the one singing for um, most of the verse and then Lane comes in, but that's a, he's doing like a little uh, hammer on and it's kind of got a weird rhythm to it um, following Sean's, Sean's drums. So yeah, just coming up with little parts like that, then just keep your interest, you know, it just piques your interest. And uh, that's just something I think he's so good at. Yeah, especially on the two later albums, he kind of really focuses a lot more on guitar layering, mm-hmm. like on Dirt and especially self titled Oh, yeah. Oh and he God. does a lot of guitar layering mm-hmm. and beautiful fills over top, just small little, you know, harmonic parts and some just to really f- flush out the sound. That's why those albums are so special. Yeah, especially like on like Shame and You. Um, it's sorry. like they're... they're there couldn't be a song more unique than that one. Yeah. His it, guitar playing on that. Yeah, like that that riff that he's playing in the beginning, it goes throughout the whole verse, but it feels like he's playing much more than just that. Um, just because there's so many layers of guitars going, and he creates just such a an atmosphere for you to live in in that album. I, oh, that's that's my favorite Alice in Chains album, for sure. Self-titled. This is Self-titled. the second time he's... Self-titled is he's my favorite. It. But... um. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's Jerry just does such a good job of coming up with different guitar parts that you wouldn't necessarily think of and don't necessarily make sense, but they work perfectly in their music and even their newer stuff. It's um, with William Duvall, it's still it sounds like Alice in Chains. Still, they haven't lost their sound from what they had with Lane. Obviously, the the absence and loss of Lane is like the biggest thing um for them as a band and you can't replace Lane Staley obviously but you know Jerry's still a top tier musician and still writing great music and even his solo stuff um is good shit too so yeah um but yeah like we've just listened to so many of his like influences for a long time you know we've listened to to Sabbath and Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and Van Halen. I mean, Van Halen was one of his biggest influences and it's, it kind of just shows in his playing. Um, Yeah, exactly. Everyone's influenced by Eddie Van Halen. Rest in peace. That was Um, just his birthday yesterday. Yeah, it was. Oh yeah. Um, But yeah, Uh, it just shows in his playing style, what his influences are. Um, But yeah, what, you got yeah, anything else to are, say? We, I always like to say he blues suck. He blues sucks. Yeah. Which, like, uh, it just is use of the minor pentatonics. Mm-hmm. Or, a master, master class. Yeah. Great in, inserts blues licks at perfect times. Fra- his phrasing's amazing. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Like, his phrasing and his use of 
relatively simple power chords um, just to create a lot of the songs and the riffs that they have and feeling like he breaks out of the pentatonic box with staying in the pentatonic box, you know? It's, once you learn like a lot of their solos and stuff, it's not, you're like, you step back from it and you're like, oh, okay, this is like easy to break down, but it's complex in the way that he phrases it and the way that he would play it. That's, yeah. Yeah, we're not some music theory geniuses, but we know a little bit yeah. enough to kind of communicate. But uh, at some point in a later one of these episodes, we're going to try and have a yeah, we're gonna, guitar set up. Yeah, we're going to get like, so we have amps and stuff over here. So we're going to try and get some amps mic'd up and everything so we can play some riffs while we're talking about it. Because I feel like that's just easier to express what we're talking about if we can play it at the same time. Yeah, we may so. have to insert some uh, some of these guitars because there's yeah. so much we can play from these guitars. Like it's hard when you're just sitting here mm-hmm. to try and just pick out stuff. Yeah, uh, to so. try and think of stuff that you that you know and like, because like I know mo- most of the Dirt album and all those riffs are so fun to play. There's like a lot of them are really slidey. I feel like and yeah, they're just so fun to play. So sludgy, especially the riff for Dirt. The song Dirt is just, oh my God. One of my favorites. One of my favorite Jerry riffs. Just um, sludgy. That's that's all I can describe it as. Yeah, one thing you were kind of going on about how uh, he makes like something that maybe shouldn't work, work. Yeah. Well, the perfect example of that is, um, well, no, I'm blanking on the name, uh, from Facelift. Um, Bleed the Freak, no. Confusion. Um, love hate love. Yes, love hate yeah. love because it's so it's dissonant. There's oh, open yeah. strings in there. He's up on the mid high frets. It's weird. That riff is hard. It is a hard riff just because of the way he plays it and the way he phrases it. Um, it's a lot slower than their other stuff, so it's just kind of stripped down. I feel like, and that's super hard to play like that. But then going back into what's next after love hate love, sea of sorrow. I want to say yes, but uh. Just going into that after Love, Hate, Love, it's like just picks the speed back up right away. It's so sick. I, I love Facelift, too. I love every Alice in Chains album. Can't, can't hold me back from that. It's just uh, my favorite band, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, Facelift is so good. Yeah. yeah it's hard to... The first seven, like, seven songs off Facelift. Eight songs? Sunshine. Oh, yeah. First eight songs off Facelift are just peak. They're so good. And for the for it being their first album is just absolutely crazy. <sighs> yeah, and you know we can kind of go in a little bit on his acoustic playing. Yeah, his acoustic playing is great, and especially on the unplugged album. Oh my god! With songs like "Over Now," he uses open E flat. Yeah, I think it's open E flat. Something like that. And the chord, the chord, and the picking patterns are unbelievable. And he's singing at the same time, bro. It's so that "Over Now" is such a good song, just because. You know, I mean, they obviously didn't know it at the time, but writing that song, it's like the last song on the album of Alice in Chains. I'm um, self-titled. It's like the last real song that we get from them besides um, Died and uh, Get Born Again, I think, um, in the music bank. But, you know, it's just, yeah, Over Now is one of my favorite Jerry riffs. And then you got Frogs or like... Uh, Got Me Wrong, which is another acoustic one. Got Me Wrong is so good. That one, like you were talking about last episode, just basic bar chords. Yeah, exactly. They make sound like a, practically a dual guitar attack, yeah. but it's just him. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, Jerry is just absolutely one of my favorite guitar- Well, my favorite guitarist ever. Just the, also his stage presence. Um, you know, the classic hair, hair whip and the, uh, I don't know, just... Seeing him, like, since we've seen them live, like, seeing him up there and just being in the presence was, like, damn. Like, he commands. Yeah, he has a commanding presence, and, it, I mean, it shows for sure. Jerry's just a badass. Jerry Cantrell, if you see this, you're a badass. Um, yeah, Jerry is just one of our favorite guitarists. He, uh, Ryan definitely idolizes, or, uh, idolizes him a lot more than yeah. I do, but, of course, I mean, how can I even downplay it? And yeah. Jerry's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And insanely special and just uh, a very unique guitarist. Has so many different 
influences and past experiences that affect how he writes music and how he looks at making music is just um yeah it's very why people feel their music so deep yeah it, it resonates so well yeah yeah well so we've gone through jerry um shout out jerry gantrell my favorite guitarist of all time okay. so our the next guitarist we're gonna go to is someone that is debatable to be in what they would say like what the big five big five um so we're gonna be talking about dean DeLeo of stone temple pilots <laughs> Yeah, so this is a personal favorite of mine. Yeah, uh, I have another one in this list too, but um, Dean is just so unique. Yeah, with everything he does. Like we talk about Jerry being unique, but then you go to Dean and you listen to some of some of the stuff that he was writing, and you're like, damn, like listening to it and actually trying to play it or trying to pick it out um, to know what he's playing. It's damn near impossible. It's tough. Yeah, when you get to the later albums, especially like Tiny Music or um, Shangla Di Da, it's tough to pick out what he's playing. And um, just the evolution of his playing, uh, especially later on, you get so many of his like jazz influences and uh, I mean, like fusion this, rock influences. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Like if you just even think of like Too Cool Queenie album track off of um, Shangla Di Da, it's you know, those are definitely jazz chords mm-hmm. or, you know, jazz adjacent there. And also when, when you're at it's SDP, it's always kind of hard to know who's really writing the song. Yeah. Necessarily, necessarily. Cause like sometimes Rob could help Dean on a riff or yeah. like Eric could have something too, or Scott even coming up with something like on dead and bloated. Yeah, exactly. Just, um, they all have musical minds. Um, very like think very musically. Um, but you know, Dean and Rob, that, combo of dean on the guitar another voice crack there dean on the guitar um i don't know if he really comes up with the voicing but i'm sure he does um you might know a little bit more about that like if he comes up with the voicings or if that's mainly rob because i know that rob comes up with a lot of the music aspects to it but i don't know because dean writes a lot of the music yeah I, that's a whole thing it just you no know, uh, Rob was like the main part of a uh, was the main part of Plush because that was, I think that was or it might have been Interstate that was supposed to be like a little Bossa Nova thing. Yeah, that's. I yeah, think that's actually both of them were supposed to be. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, Plush and I think Interstate was more of the Bossa Nova one, but yeah, it it showed like you can literally hear if you strip it down. We I mean we've heard um, him like strip it down a little bit and it's you can just hear it like. Um, but some that Dean also does so well is his little fills in between, um, riffs, his little licks. And I mean, we've been lucky enough to see them live uh, like three times. three times. Um, and you know, seeing them live is a different experience. Um, we sadly, we're not able to see them with Scott, but, um, they still bring it as musicians and they know it's time to deliver and they they have delivered every single time we've seen them it's uh yeah if you were ever to see us at stp show we're probably front row yeah screaming hard. screaming every single lyric um yeah i think it's just their music is just such an experience it is and yeah it's such a huge part of it like and really kind of getting more back to his the guitar playing like his chord like you said his chord voicings are so unique and the way, in, like, just how do, how do you even write a song around what Interstate's chords was? It's just, like, you know, chromatic down. Yeah. But just, like, the extra. That's notes the extra. That he adds yeah. And, the extra little notes that ring out just kind of add so much essence to the song of what it, what it feels like it should be, you know? I mean, that song just makes me think of summer. It just makes me feel like going on a drive. And I think it, he just does that perfect. It's a country song. It's literally a country song, and it's just... With distorted guitars. Yeah, it's just rebranded into a hard rock song, which they, they do that so well. Um, man, I love SDP. They just have such a variety of styles in their, yeah. in their catalog, just like from like a slow ballad creep to... 
<laughs> to uh, a to just an absolute blazing track like tripping on a hole and we got to talk about that bro that solo is, that solo is disgusting stylistic mm-hmm. differences great phrasing great legato at the end too just man that that solo is so fun to play if you guys have not if if any of you are like guitar players and you want to try to challenge yourself to learn a solo learn tripping on a hole because that one will take you through a range of different styles and techniques that you have to use and it's just so fun to play once you get it down um lady picture show is also just a stylistic yeah. masterpiece yeah and the chords he uses on that are kind of jazz adjacent chords as well i feel like um but with distorted guitars which is just so it's so cool i think taking those chords that he uses from you know like west montgomery and django reinhardt and then putting them into the context of hard rock is so cool it, it works so well and something that you wouldn't expect to work it's well about as rock as you could get yeah basically yeah yeah man yeah we we both absolutely love dean he's always been my one of my favorite guitar players mm-hmm. from the 90s era and you know it's kind of always a toss-up on whether whether people include them yeah in the 90s grunge because they of course were not they're from san diego yeah not from seattle but you know they're part right there with them mm-hmm. in 1992 yeah i um i don't know you could lump them in with the big five big five i'll be fine with that um but we should talk about dean's rig a little bit his this is this more you i don't know so so he um his rig i'll try to put a picture of it up on screen um but his his rig is really it's something weird he's got uh two marshall cabs with a vox ac30 in the middle and then he runs it through a demeter preamp without he doesn't use like um effects pedal like uh overdrive or anything like that it, you know he runs it all through his demeter preamp and i think may, he might have like a tube screamer or um something like that but then i think he just had a wah and maybe an oct an octave or and then like a delay or something from yeah, we, we from what i could yeah from what i could see on his pedal board when we saw him it, 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 he has a really weird setup i'll try to there's like a guitar like diagram of what he does so I'll, I'll try to put that on screen so you can look at it if you are interested in that but um yeah really weird rig and he uses um mostly les pauls yeah just a, as not recent they use nelson's mm-hmm. i think i I've, i'm not really familiar with them i but think they sound is nelson like, made by fender I, I i don't know i don't know yeah i'm not sure so. they're custom yeah, yeah they're like boutique guitars yeah all right um, just, we're just going to go until it dies then. Yeah. So, Keep anyways, Dean. Dean just, you know, he only he mostly uses Les Pauls, but then you got him on, like, the Army of Anyone, um, uh, what is it, offshoot project with um, Richard, Patrick. Richard Patrick of Filter. And um, he's using a double neck strat with only one humbucker in the with bridge. Humbucker. One it's humbucker. so weird. A one humbucker. And then, you know, two cool queenie. He's using a Strat on that one. And I think on Loungefly, he uses a Telecaster. So, because I think it's in, what, Open G? No, it was like Open D flat. Yeah, something weird. A weird tuning, once again, but... I'm a nerd. Yeah, it's... um, Man, Dean is definitely one of our favorite guitarists, if you couldn't tell. Um, yeah, we, could, we could just dive into, like, literally every song. And I think once we have our setup that we want with you know, micing up amps and everything, it'll be way easier for us to kind of go into what we're talking about um, and, like, break stuff down a little bit better and just because, you know, it's easier to do something when you actually have it in your hand. But, uh, yeah, it's... Man, Dean is just awesome. And, you know, he's he's just a stand-up guy, I, I feel like. You know, every time we've, we've ever seen him, he, he's always smiling and, like, interacting with the crowd and, uh, you know, just a, just a good guy. Love Dean. Absolutely love Dean. Awesome. But um, you ready to go to our next guitarist? Sure. All right. So the next guitarist is going to be kind of Colby's lead right here. So I'll let you go into it. Yeah. Th- this guitarist I could go on for for about like 30 minutes. Just about like, you know, it's hard to always, especially when you're in the hot seat now, bring it in. But uh, our third guitarist, uh, kind of what he said, Mix up like new metal alternative, um, just everything now. Uh, it's uh, Mike Einzinger from Incubus. <laughs> it's 
just one of my like just now my favorite all-time guitarist um there's so many so many different things that we could talk about with him uh he's got he uses insane chords yeah all the time in all their songs whatever it may be a lot of um like sitar influence with a lot of his, uh, a lot of a lot of Easter music. Eastern music influence two, for sure. Yeah, like two note bends that he does. Mm-hmm. Um, just open up the landscape of their music. Um, his use of effects is really cool, though. Yeah, really cool as well. Weird setups. Like Mike mm-hmm. might have the weirdest setup of them all. Just he has uh, maybe eighteen pedals or something on. This. It's crazy. It's like a John Frusciante setup because he's got many, many that he uses. Just like the sheet of wood that he put yeah so and just so many pedals <laughs> look at something up real quick keep going yeah but um and also just like an excellent uh or just awesome amps that he use, uses mesa boogies i think they're two by 12 he might he might use smaller now i'm pretty sure but um uh there's just so much stylistic influence yeah to me as well from from mike just like the guitar that he uses during Morning View era, he was using hollow body PRSs PRS. with piezos. Yeah, it's like the, and he he's a like main mainly PRS player, isn't he? Uh, yeah. Back in the day, he's kind of like switched. Does, you know? does he? Did he have his own signature model? I I don't I don't think so, but he, I think he used PRSs most at the beginning, and then he kind of switched to Ernie Ball, Albert Lee's because he has okay. carpal tunnel. Oh, really actually? Yeah, and then now he plays mostly telecasters. Yeah. Live now. Which is crazy cuz like you think of telecaster you'd be like, "Oh, not really going to get incubus sound from a telecaster." But you get incubus sound from a telecaster, bro. When you're playing through those Mesa boogies. It's yeah. Like, yeah. And I mean, we saw them live and they were phenomenal. They were so good live. And I I read a comment the other day that said um Incubus is one of the only bands that I've heard actually sounds just like they do on the radio live and i would say that they did even now like brandon sounded great and mike was just killing it on the guitar the entire time yeah i i just think it's always so difficult because you want to make a song sound full Mm. the the thing that mike does is just like can make single note stuff sound huge yeah i like like on the warmth his arpeggiating through that whatever i don't know what chord that is but Man, that's a, that's such a cool riff, and it just it feels warm, like. That's that phaser and delay. That's yeah. Right. But yeah, he makes single note. There's a lot of stuff from first album sign, or not technically the first album, but which sign a lot of single note stuff, two note. Um. He can play. He can play leads too. Yeah. He doesn't do it a lot, but a few songs on the first on the second album. And the, yeah, like. I don't know if you could go more into that, but I know that they're more of a band that doesn't really rely on solos in their in their songs. It's more of like instrumental breaks um, instead of solos. So, like, do you know why they do that? Or I don't know. I just think they kind of like maybe from a new metal influence, they're kind of just more focused on riffs mm-hmm. instead of maybe uh, you know chords to a solo section. Yeah, something like that. But the song "Are You In" from Morning View has like a little solo in it. Mm-hmm. Um, Echo also off of Morning View as a solo a, with a with Morning View is harmonics. such a good album, bro. Such oh, a good, good album. It's such a, a good album. But yeah, their style has definitely evolved over over time. And I know Ryan isn't necessarily as versed as I am. Yeah. Because I just I've listened to been listening to so much. Yeah, I mean Colby Mike Einzinger is basically like Colby's Jerry for me. Um kind of both have we listen we both listen to different kinds of music when we're not listening to alternative um but you know colby goes more towards incubus i go to towards alice in chains more and more like metalcore stuff as well but that stuff's good too but yeah uh yeah I don't, there's just something so eccentric eccentric about his playing it, mm-hmm. it just like it inspires me so much to like yeah try and be something similar to that oh i can i mean i can hear it in your playing like even when we jam and stuff it's like you, we do try to go for a lot of those single note riffs into something heavier, um, like going from a clean to a heavy with some nice effects on there. And you, you even like sent us a riff the other day that was actually really cool. That like sounded a lot like Incubus, something that they would write. And I, you can definitely tell that it's a big influence on you. Yeah, I don't. It's you know, it's kind of just been an out of the blue thing, but mm. 
I you know I think that most people would agree that Mike is um, underrated, underappreciated. I, 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 the the word underrated has just been really oversaturated. Yeah. You know, as of late, we tr- me and Ryan, or Ryan and I, try and yeah filter it out. But Under- sometimes you know I yeah his name doesn't get brought up a lot. Not not as much as it should. Definitely underappreciated. Um, and also like just the ability to like do something as different as they have, and also yeah. be as commercially successful. Yeah, like they've evolved their sound so much. That first album that they put out is mainly just a funk album. Fungus um, Among Us. Yeah, Fungus Among Us. It's it's mainly a funk album. No, Enjoy Incubus. That's an EP. EP. Sorry. Whatever. Well, but I, that's yeah, it's I, it's mostly funk though. It's like really funky stuff uh, compared to. I mean, they still do like have funky riffs obviously but it's more went more into mixing with the metal aspect of it as well um and then also having like the the dj back there as well Mm -hmm. that adds so much dynamic to the songs um especially like uh are you in or um you know that's i mean nice to know you as well that's got a good little dj section in there but yeah yeah, yeah. The, the second album is, is full of a lot of DJ stuff. It's a different one now that they they've had two DJs mm. now that they switched after that album. But I, he's just I don't know. Mike is just so unique. Mm-hmm. I know I've said that a lot, but uh, there's just so much to take away from him. Just there's there's a lot to learn from from him for sure. That you can just kind of sit down and be like, oh. I would never thought to play something like that and then just gather a lot of inspiration from him. And then, I mean, that's what we try to do. You know, we sit down and listen to music all the time, trying to get inspiration for stuff that we're trying to work on. So it's, you know, having those multitude of influences really makes a huge difference in the kind of music that you play in general. So I highly recommend if anyone is like a guitar player or drummer or, bass player even even a singer you know just sit down and listen to a ton of different music and just get influences from everywhere it helps so much um yeah anything else you want to add for mike um uh, you've just been such an like i said just such an influence on my mm-hmm. playing recently i just i absolutely love their music it's something especially science the second album was so like weird to get into i'd say just kind of like the it's like an alice in chains tripod yes like it's just yeah. like it's so different yeah it pushes your boundaries a little bit and you gotta have some musical uh push like you gotta have yeah. boundaries like actually want to listen to it yeah and also you gotta like you know be willing to accept something different yeah but mike's just a phenomenal player jazz influence as well mm. and uh just one of my favorite guitar players from the 90s and of all time. So, Mike, if you're seeing this, shout out you. Um, so, you know, we've gone through Mike. Obviously, um, the last guitarist on our list is one that's kind of a what if. Um, you know, what would what would have happened if he would have kept being able to make music? So, the next guitarist that we're going to be talking about, and the last guitarist we're going to be talking about is Jeff Buckley. Yeah, this one's going to be a little, quite a bit shorter because, you know, yeah. he didn't have enough time to really... An illustrious co- career as as he should have, but... But what an album. What an what album an Grace album. is, bro. I, Oh, my God. It's like, it's one that you can, you know, a lot of people can't just sit down and listen to an album. Um, what? Nothing. A lot of people just can't, like, can't just, like, sit down and listen to an album. It's fine. Can I have a wa- no, I want it. Oh. Sorry. Go, go ahead and do it. Um, so a lot of people can't just like sit down and listen to an album, but I think Grace is just such a... Man, you just put that on and it kind of just takes you away. You know? It's... um. That slowly rides you down like a, yeah. like a stream, like an experience. Yeah, it, it is an experience. And like, man, just that opening with Mojo Pin... That that song is so sick, it's so good. And then I can't. I mean, I don't remember what it goes into um, after that, but 
you know, you got songs like So Real. Lover You Should Have Come Over is a masterpiece. It's, it's my, just a masterpiece in songwriting. And it's my favorite, my favorite Jeff Buckley. It's so, so beautiful. One of, oh my God. There's a video I saw on YouTube recently of a guy um, covering it with a 12 string. He's in like a dark, a, just like a dark alley. And he kills it, by the way. Um, but man, that song and just the, his his writing, his approach to writing and, you know, using the guitar as an extension of his voice, just, oh my, I think that perfect almost, player. I think that Mike and Jeff are a little similar in a way. Because mm-hmm. when you think of so real, kind of like a single note, double note. Oh, yeah. And, you know, making the most of it, like the beginning part, is very and full. Yeah. Being How, note. yeah, it, it feels like it's almost pitchy a little bit um but it's not it it works perfectly and then you know going into that with the chords that he uses in that song it's something that you wouldn't even expect um but it it works so well once again and man jeff buckley was just such a phenomenal musician all around you know and phenomenal person as well his um live at cna album is one of the like best live albums for sure um, if you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. Live at CNA. Sweet uh, thing. It's, it's a great one oh to check out. Van God. Morrison cover. I absolutely love it. I don't know if he does the cover of Mommy, You've Been on My Mind um, by Bob Dylan at that one. But if you haven't listened to that cover as well that he does, that's a beautiful one. Yeah, there, there's so many like great songs we can talk about with Jeff. Like Grace, the, the song Grace, the beginning picking part. Mm-hmm. There's some of the most beautiful like i've ever heard in my yeah. life yeah it's so clean it's fast it's, and then i mean unique. you know his cover of hallelujah one of the most beautiful reverb tones ever ever recorded it's, it's so it, yeah that that's like when you, when you talk to people about tone chasing that jeff buckley reverb tone on hallelujah is a tone that most people chase and try to go after because it's just so profound it's so well known and that, oh, just the way that he plays it as well. Um, yeah, that's mostly finger pick song. Yeah. And I, With the capo on there as well. I, it's just crazy how like, he finds these interesting voicings. And, like, mm-hmm. you know, you, no slouch on the voicings thing either. Just, like, when you watch him play live, especially, like, Lover, You Should Have Come Over. Yeah. He's sliding all over the place. Sliding all over. And, yeah, there's so many weird chord Put stuff shapes. stuff between, like, normal parts of the song yeah. or the regular parts of the song. And if it doesn't... It doesn't feel like it breaks it up. It just carries on to the next part. And I think that works so well. Um, but like you were saying, like even on a song like Corpus Christi Carol, it's it's kind of a weird song. Like you wouldn't, it's not necessarily something you'd expect, especially coming off, what, what's before that one? Corpus Christi? Yeah. Lover, you should have come over. Yeah, so like going from easily one of his best songs that he ever wrote um just in terms of lyrical content and musical content is just and then going to that where he's doing just a high what what would you even call that not what corpus christi carol you know i'm not as familiar with that one it's like, all the other songs pretty much i know here i'll put it on real quick but it's like we still haven't even touched some of the great songs on a one great still like last That's goodbye is absolutely amazing. lilac yeah. wine is such a beautiful cover. Oh, forget her forget her is like probably my oh. second favorite on the on the album it's eternal life as well just so almost an angelic type type voice that he's delivering there um and also, his use of guitar is phenomenal. Yeah. Telecaster. Telecaster. Or his choice of guitar. Choice of guitar, yeah. With a mirrored pet guard. So cool. 1980-something. So cool. Awesome. And I feel like that is something also that helps him get that sound. That It's chimey. Very chimey. It's very, it's very country-esque. And, uh, yeah, like you said, chimey. It's just... Bells sound like they're ringing when he's playing, when he was playing. Yeah, he's probably playing twin reverbs or something like yeah. that. Yeah, definitely a Fender amp. It's got to be. Yeah, for sure. I don't. I don't know. 
I'll look it up after this and see. But uh, yeah, man, Jeff Buckley. And then, you know, his posthumous album, Sketches for My Sweetheart, The Drunk, um, you know, we're not as well versed in that one. I haven't listened to that one as much. But songs like Vancouver or like Witches Rave or just songs that you're like, is this the same guy that and then, dropped Grace? Yeah, and then everybody here wants you. Just all of a sudden he's dropping an R&B song. Yeah, exactly. Just the differentiation in style that he has is just. Yeah, just as eclectic as his father was. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, just jumping styles. Just yeah. I think, I mean, I don't know if we talked about this, but that's that. I think that's just what music should be about, you know? Like, not being afraid to switch up your style and discover new shit that you like it's not it's not set in stone what you have to play i feel like every every album can be different every song can be different it doesn't have to be a continuous cycle of just the same songs otherwise you get bored and that's how people fall out of love with music yeah sometimes an album can be one all concerning theme mm-hmm. i don't know what i mean by all concerning but all one theme but it's nice to have the mashup yeah but you gotta let your influences flow a little bit exactly that's why unique to yourself as well uh, yeah but uh, i mean a lot of the jeff buckley songs are are covers that he does he does a lot of covers or did a lot of covers and you know just to show where those influences came from in his playing but yeah jeff buckley man he's one of our favorite um guitarists slash singer songwriters of the 90s and um Dearly missed. It's really sad that we can never know what what else he would have been able to go on and do. Um, I think they're still like trying to release like mu- unreleased music, but you know, new stuff that we have not heard is just something that we can never have anymore. So that's it's just very very sad. Um, but rest in peace, Jeff Buckley. But um, yeah, is that? All we want to touch on? Yeah, I mean, I guess we could go on about each of these guitars yeah. for so long. But uh, we kind of wanted to keep this a little short, especially since we don't have our full setup. We wanted to yeah. uh, kind of just uh, have a little discussion about them. And we just, we could t- we can do one about bassists. We can be doing one about drummers. Duos of bass and drums, guitar guitar duos, lead singers, obviously. Mm-hmm. The, the list is endless of what we can do, so... If you guys want to, you know, leave a comment on what you want to see for sure, um, we would love to just read your suggestions and see what you guys want to see. So, yeah, anything else you want to add, Colby? Um, Nothing. All right. So this has been the Puddle of Grunge podcast. We do hope that you guys enjoyed. Um, Make sure to like, subscribe, obviously, all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, I'm Ryan. I'm Colby. Peace out, guys.